So I'm here to talk about law, ethics, and AI. Um, and I think this is very important, a little bit about my background. Um, I wear a lot of hats in the community, but actually what I do day to day as a lawyer is I work in artificial intelligence, I work with big data, and I also work with data ethics, which is a burgeoning field uh, in a legal perspective because a lot of companies are focused on data privacy, they're not focused on data ethics. So a lot of the work I do is really big picture questions around technology and around whether or not the use of technology is the best for people. So, you know, I want to start off by saying that this isn't brand new. Our first panel um, you know, referenced this, and this stuff was, came out in 1956. This was the first time the term was used. And so, as someone who works in regulatory law, we've had 70 years to figure this out. We've had 70 years to have the conversations, the legal conversations, the human conversations about AI, and we still are all collectively shrugging our shoulders because we don't know what to do. We don't know the legal framework. We don't know the ethical frameworks. We don't have the answers to the questions that people that are naysayers about AI, they don't always have those answers. And so one of the things that I want to challenge the audience today and challenge generally our society is really starting to think about these big picture questions because the moment that things start to get popularized, and I would say that 2022 and 2023 are really when we're seeing the use of AI more collectively across the United States and across the world, regulators want to handle it. When regulators want to handle it, we end up with legal systems that don't work for your business and don't work for society. So oftentimes, people know the tools, they don't know the rules. This is sort of the story of the internet, the story of any technology. So rinse and repeat every time you get to a new technology, the government does not know how to deal with it. So the internet, the law that regulated the internet actually date back to 1933 and 1934. So we're not moving fast enough at the pace of the law. And when the law doesn't move fast enough, usually what legislators react to is panic. And so when you start seeing those articles about the dangers of AI or AI replacing workers, that's what legislators and their staff are reacting to. So it might not be your reality on the ground of how you're using AI and your use cases and more stories about how powerful it is, it's that sort of mass panic because they don't know how to use the tools. And I hope I'm not saying anything that isn't obvious. Your members of Congress are not technology experts. And so they have no idea what you're doing day to day in your business, nonetheless how to use the internet, nonetheless how to use AI tools. And so it's important that we understand this and we start to come up with guardrails on our own to make sure that we're able to continue to use these technologies in a way that empower your businesses. Um, and the law does not catch up quickly, but neither do social norms. You know, if you were to talk to the average person on the street and ask about AI, they probably have some vision in their head of some movie from the 1980s or 90s where AI takes over the world and it's just a dangerous place. Or when I ask people about AI, one of the top things I hear is the show Westworld. And that is their vision of AI. That robots in a theme park start to take over and gain sentience and then all hell breaks loose. So the impressions of AI for public conscience are not necessarily ones that would convince you as a business owner that AI would be the best for your business. But the reality is that AI has been around for a while. So super smart algorithms are placing humans. That's also something that I hear, some version of this or another. Um, and the reality is, and again, other speakers alluded to this earlier, this is not meant to replace people. It's meant to augment and support people in their roles. Um, but there also, though, is the risk, and I'll talk about this in a few minutes, that there will be that displacement of workers. And so we can't ignore that when we talk about AI. So a couple things for your consideration. I apologize, my fonts are off from what I sent, so a little bit crunch. First, I'm going to talk about misinformation capacity. Again, several speakers have alluded to this. If the tools are not always right, they make things up, they create things. And as a business owner, the last thing you want to do is put out bad information to your customers. It could displace workers. We should at least think about that in this conversation today. Who owns AI-generated content? There's been several cases already about whether AI tools own the content. Do the creator of the AI tools own the content? If you use an AI tool to create content, do you actually own it? Copyright is a very tricky thing in the US. Professions with duties of care. I'm in one of those professions. I'm a lawyer. I write a legal brief and I use ChatGPT. Am I actually exercising my duty of care? One of the things that AI and the capacity that I see with AI is the healthcare industry and doctors. 
but doctors also have a duty of care. And so, you know, are we comfortable with our doctors asking AI to ask questions to give you care? And so are there professions where we're not comfortable with AI? And finally, who is regulating it? And ironically, as a lawyer, I'm not a big fan of regulations, even though they keep me in business. Um, but I think in the technology space, we've seen them really hamper development and hamper businesses coming up with their own regulatory schemes. So first, we'll talk about misinformation capacity. So algorithms are biased. Why are they biased? <clears throat> Excuse me. Algorithms are developed by humans. Humans are biased. I think that that's probably kind of a no uh, statement, particularly given our very divided political environment today. People are biased. That's the reality. People develop the algorithm. They develop technology. Those biases may be built in. And so these biases make their way into algorithms and how they operate. So we just can't ignore that fact. Um, algorithms be algorithms. They're designed to perform how they were designed to perform. And so, again, you know, there are ways to prompt these technologies. There are ways to create nuance in these technologies. But just remember, they're still algorithms. They're not humans. Um, and again, back to nuance. You know, when we do our jobs, um, many of us are trained as experts in different fields. We gain an expertise. Like, you know your business, you're an expert in your business. But you're also a human, you have nuance, you have emotion. You know how to read a room, you know how to read a customer. Your tools, your AI tools, you know, may not know how to do that. And finally, bad customer service is bad information. I think ChatGPT is awesome. But a lot of why it's awesome is because people learn how to guide it. They create the correct prompts, they go with the right information. But then they take that information, and again, with their human lens, with their human expertise game lens, they look at it to make sure that before it goes out to a customer that the inaccuracies that may be in there are correct. Because you don't want to put together a blog post of the top 10 things that, that your business does and try to tell customers they should do it and five of those things are wrong. Or you don't want to create tips or create you know, ways to do X, Y, and Z and the information is not accurate or it's misspelled or it stole information from someone else's website and all of a sudden you find yourself in a legal issue because it gave you someone else's tips. And those tips are proprietary. Those tips were created by somebody and they can assert a copyright. Displacement of workers. So I just want to recognize that the U.S. Employment Equal Opportunity Employment Commission is already looking at AI. Um, they are not doing it yet. What they lens are trying to crack down on the use of AI. But they are asking big picture questions, which is one, using AI to make employment decisions. You know, how does that factor in? You know, in today's environment, more often than not, humans are making those decisions. There's a variety of factors that take into place. Well, you can create tools that basically, in a quantitative fashion, decide whether or not someone should be hired. How does that impact hiring? Does that take into account discrimination? There are federal laws that protect people in the employment seeking process. Um, and also just the impacts of AI on the employment industry. So just you know, in terms of how people get employed, the employment process, human resources, you know, the EEOC has just actively started an initiative to start talking about this. And as a lawyer, I welcome that because we've seen the absence of that in the past. We have not seen government agencies at the federal level or state level have conversations. They need to jump in and start thinking, how can I regulate? And so these are the types of conversations I would say as a business owner to keep tasks on because what the EEOC does is they are a regulator. And so eventually they may have guidelines. And so this is a way to sort of keep track of where they're going in the employment space. Um, AI is part of the role of the employee. So are you asking employees to use AI as part of your job function? Is AI being included in a job description? Is that not a requirement to work at your company? And with the above two requests, are you eventually eliminating the need for that person and for their job? And I'm not saying this will eliminate the need, but I'm saying you should think about this consciously in terms of how you're using AI. Because for some small businesses, as you plan your growth, you may realize, I don't have to hire yet because I'm using AI. And that could be a cost savings that you reinvest in your business that propels growth and allows you to hire those employees eventually. But if you are a more established business, you might have the alternate issue, which is I don't need people anymore than a certain person in their role. So this is a big picture question. I've lost myself. <laughs> I'll keep talking. Uh, finally, the last thing to think about is, you know, after the Great Recession in 2008, there was so much emphasis 
on getting workers technology skills. A lot of older workers were displaced by that recession. A lot of younger workers didn't have the skills that meant the economy. And we really put a premium on making sure people get technology skills. Well, now we have AI technologies that are more publicly used. Are what's going to happen to those workers? We really push people to learn technology skills. We push technology degrees. We push trade skill programs that are dependent on technology. What happens to those people? And so again, these are more big picture questions, not do the bloom. I'm just here to facilitate conversation. Um, ownership of AI generated content. So there's already been a judge who has found that there's no copyright ownership of AI generated content, either by tools, by the creators of those tools, or people that use those tools. The other thing to think about is you are using tools created by companies. And so these are corporate owned tools, they create their own rules. Every time you use one of these tools, if they have a terms of use or a privacy policy, those are contracts. You're agreeing to those contracts. More often than not, you're probably not saying to yourself, before I use this, let me read the intellectual property clause about who owns what when I use this tool. The reality is they probably retain the ownership rights. And that's something else to think about depending on the tool. I'm not just talking about chat GPT. We've had speakers today that have told you about thousands of tools and given you at least 100 examples, but they're companies. They're out there to make money. This is not philanthropy. And so when you're not running a philanthropy charitable organization, and you're trying to run a for-profit company and get people to use your tool and generate income, you're probably going to want to own what you're doing, and you might want to own what you're doing. So I would just say that as you use these tools, depending on whether your business is really heavily dependent on proprietary information, just think about the copyright issues as you do it. Um, isn't this a duty of care? So in, in my industry, I would never use ChatGPT to actually do my work. I would say that's violating a duty of care, my duty of royalty as a lawyer, to like go try to generate a legal brief or a memo or advice that I would give to a client. But lawyers have done that. And Lawyers have gotten in trouble already. There was a case out of New York, now one other state, where a lawyer actually had ChatGPT do all of their research for a legal filing, and ChatGPT made up cases. And so when the judge and the clerks of the judge was looking through, they couldn't find the case in the legal databases. That's how you end up losing your license as a lawyer. You're not only failing your client, but you didn't even do the research. Double check before you file for the court of law, but that's what that's what to think about though. Like, where a lawyer would be fine to get a bar complaint. A doctor, if they were using the AI tool, would not double check. Um, and, and AI tools and technology are very you know, rapidly growing, they're varied in how they augment how the care is delivered. I think AI is going to play a wonderful role in telemedicine and making sure that more people have access to technology. But doctors also have a duty of care to take an oath. So these are professions where there are consequences for the misuse of AI. I would get in a lot of trouble if I use AI to do my job. But there are not, that's not a duty of care in all professions. And so one of the questions that I ask when I get talked about this is, can AI tools care in the sense of like thinking about these things a little more holistically, but also can they implement a duty of care? Can you actually engineer them in a way that there is a duty of care? And so when I hear people sort of offhandedly say, AI is going to replace lawyers, ha ha ha, you're going to be out of a job. I'm like, well, I don't think anytime soon, but I also have something in my head, a little something on my shoulder when I work with clients, which is I have to make sure I'm doing this in their best interest. That's my job. My job is to be loyal to their agenda, and my job is to make sure I am doing the best job for them. And so that's another big picture question, can they have a duty of care? Finally, who was regulating this stuff? And I'm not going to spend all day talking about the 20 agencies that are trying to regulate this in the United States right now, and that's at the federal level, but what is the right regulatory model? I was in telecommunications uh, public affairs work. I worked actually as a lobbying industry for a while in telecommunications, and that was the question with the internet. That was the question of social networks. We're still asking those questions. Should the government be regulated? That's an open-ended question. People of all ends of the political spectrum have different ideas, and also the technology space. Some people are for regulation, some people think, let it be, and let the technology space figure it out. Private sector. Can the 
private sector creates its own rules for the contracts with its users, the other means the private sector create rules and guardrails for itself. I mean, there's plenty of self-regulatory you know, industries and associations that exist in the technology space that put out guidelines. The privacy space is a great example. Clearly, there's a litany of privacy laws, but there's also a lot of self-regulation. So one of those areas is advertising technology. It is creepy. You see it all the time. But the industry has actually started to have to self-regulate. And that's why you see some of the practices change over time. So is self-regulation the right answer? And so since this is global as well, should there be a global approach? One of the things that I think is very frustrating for technology companies, and particularly uh, the AI companies like Council, is there's different laws in different states. There's different laws in the US versus Canada versus South Africa versus you name it. And that's frustrating. Because as a business, if you're trying to comply with the law, I'm sure all of you deal with this if you have any customers just outside of the state of California and don't get me started on California's regulatory environment, it's difficult. It's very difficult. And so why aren't we talking about our global approaches to make it easier to use the technology, but also that probably will lend to more accountability because everyone is using the same set of rules. So just thinking about who's regulating this stuff. And then finally, to leave you, a couple of questions about data ethics. So I generally go into companies and build out privacy programs. I work on cybersecurity. Um, the other thing that I actually love to do is I go in and help build ethics programs for larger companies, kind of asking big picture questions about, sure, we can get the data, we can use the data, we can adopt new tools, but what about the human elements of it? So I just want to leave you with seven sort of thoughts um, as you decide to use AI. And again, I'm a big proponent. My job here today, the mission, which is to kind of ask the big picture questions, law of the bottom of the fence, then run out of here. So I'm going to continue to do that. One is data sources. So when you're using AI, where is the data coming from? Who owns it? And is it an open or closed data set? Meaning, is it something that is openly available on the internet? Maybe a nonprofit created the data set and put it out into the wild? Or is it a closed data set that maybe an angry former employee from the company puts it out on the internet? So where, where is the data coming from? How are you using it? And was the consent obtained to use the data? So it's not what you do with AI, it's just general recovery anonymized or pseudonymized data. But if it's not, like where did that data set come from? You get a list of, of leads or contacts just sort of through these tools. You know, who actually owns that? And do those people even know that you have it? Just also a lawyer, big privacy problem. The positive and negative impacts. So, the good, the bad, and the ugly of how you're using the tools. Clearly, you're using them, I would hope, for positive reasons for your business. So, just kind of think about the impacts. Minimizing negative impact. So, if you know there is a negative impact when you use it, tool or any technology tool, you know, what can you do to buffer that? Like what can you do to make that something that is not as large of an impact for other people? Uh, review and iterate. Keep reevaluating your use of tools. So there might be some AI tools and other technology tools you use and clearly they don't have a negative impact. But you might start using other ones and start thinking something about this, you know, isn't right. Or you may realize that maybe you are getting in the scenario where your use of AI tools may lead to sort of a conversation about workforce production. That's an ethics conversation. That's a balancing conversation you may need to have. Um, engaging with people. Are you thinking about people in, in the use of your tools? I, I find that today um, we're, we're seeing increasingly, you know, globally sort of a, a lack of empathy and sympathy in thinking about other people just generally. But as a business owner, I don't think it's imposing for you to be, I want to make money, I want to be successful, but I also need to think about people. I think some of the best businesses in the world think about people. They think about people's rights. And so I think it's important to think about people as you use technology. They are not think they should be opposites. And finally, transparency. To the extent you can be transparent, are you being transparent? about your use of these tools. And depending on your business, you do not need to be. Um, but I just want to leave you with these data ethics considerations because this is, again, my job is sort of ask the big picture questions, but they're important questions. And as you start to use AI tools, but also you're going to start using AI tools, you're going to realize, wow, this really can help revolutionize what I'm doing. It's also the thing 
you know, if this gets regulated, what will be the impacts on your business? And so my job when I talk to business owners across the country about AI is, you know, start having these conversations. If you're getting use cases and you like AI and it's making things better for your business, pick up the phone and call your state assembly member. Call your member of Congress. Be positive about what's happening with it for you and how it's helping your business. Because the reality is that there are people out there trying to make this a big issue. USA Today will write some scare tactic article about how everything's going to go to hell because of AI, and then some 90 year old senator is going to say, hey, I'm going to run a bill and I'm going to regulate this with no knowledge of how it's impacting your business. So, again, uh, against my self-interest, I make money off regulations, but I would just encourage you to really think about these questions, be vocal about your use of these tools, communicate with your elected officials, and we'll be glad to be. Thank you.